don't, we have extra copies out on the registration desk. So we're going to start off with a few presentations from my FDA colleagues. They'll provide some opening remarks, an overview of the patient-focused drug development initiative, and also a background and overview of Chagas disease and current treatment options. Then I'll come back and review the discussion format for today. So for the first half of the meeting, for the morning part of the meeting, we have two discussion topics. Topic one is on the disease symptoms and how they impact your daily life and what matters most to you as patients. Topic two is patients' perspectives on current approaches to treating Chagas disease. So then we'll take a break for lunch. We have a one-hour break for lunch. And then the second half of the day will be a scientific discussion. And we have some wonderful scientific experts here who will be presenting their comments. And we are looking forward to a great discussion there as well. That will take us to about the last half an hour of the day, which we reserve for open public comment. An open public comment is just a time that we reserve for anybody in the audience, not just patients or patient representatives or scientific experts, anybody in the audience that would like to present additional thoughts and comments related to our topic today on Chagas disease. So we encourage you, if you'd like to, if you'd like to speak during open public comment, we encourage you to sign up. We have a registration sheet out on the desk, on the registration desk. And we'll take a look at how many people signed up and how much time each speaker will have. So we'll take sign up through lunch time. And then finally, we'll wrap up the day with some closing remarks. So as you can see, this is a full day of discussion. But we are, once again, very thankful that you're here, that you're all here, and looking forward to a really great day of learning from you. So just a few additional items. This meeting is being recorded and transcribed. And the recording and the transcript will be available on the meeting web page within a few days after the meeting. Some housekeeping items. Restrooms are back out into the lobby. And if you make a right and go all the way down the hallway, you'll see restrooms there. And there's also a kiosk, uh, which some of you see, have already uh, seen and visited. But there's a kiosk out there that sells basic sandwiches and snacks and drinks for purchase. So please feel free at any time if you need to get up and stretch, if you need to go take a break, or if you need to take a grab a snack, please feel free to do so. We want you to be as comfortable as possible for the rest of the day. And one thing that will help uh, regarding the kiosk is any time you want to go out there, if you need to you know, buy some coffee or, or anything, you can also pre-order your lunch if you'd like to eat right here on campus. Uh, you just let them know what you want, and that way it's ready and prepared for you by the time you get there for lunchtime. So they'll minimize the waiting. And then last but not least, the front three tables have microphones on your on your round table. And I just a quick note that they're a little sen they're very sensitive to sound as you can imagine. So if if your table, if somebody at your table isn't speaking at that point, just make sure you turn it off. And it's a little slide button for on and off. So if you could just keep that in off and then certainly when it's when somebody at your table is going to speak, you can slide it on up. And it takes about three to five seconds to turn on. So just to give you a heads up on that. And on that note, what I'd like to do before we turn it over for my FDA colleagues for presentations is if we could have our FDA introduce yourselves, please. And be sure to press the red button to turn the microphone on. Good morning. Ed Cox, uh, Director of the Office of Antimicrobial Products, Cedar FDA. Good morning. I'm Sumati Nambia, Director, Division of Anti-Infective Products, Cedar FDA. Good morning. I'm Joe Turner. I'm the Deputy Director for Safety in the Division of Anti-Infective Products at Cedar FDA. Good morning. I'm Maria Allende, a Medical Officer at the Division of Anti-Infective Products, at Cedar FDA. Tom Smith, Medical Team Leader, Division of Anti-Infective Products, Cedar FDA. Good morning. I'm Teresa Mullen. I direct the Office of Strategic Programs in the CEDAR FDA. Yes, good morning. Jonathan Goldsmith. I'm the Acting Associate Director for the Rare Diseases Program in the Office of New Drugs FDA. Good morning. I'm John Cobol, Director of the Office of Minority Health in the Office of the Commissioner. 
And I'm Barbara Herwalt from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Parasitic Diseases Branch. Thank you very much. And we also have some FDA colleagues here. Um, if you don't mind introducing yourself. I'm Sarah Eggers in the Office of Strategic Programs here in Cedar at FDA. Uh, Graham Thompson, same office. Vegeta Vida, same office. Great. Thank you so much. OK, Dr. Farley, I'd like to introduce Dr. Farley for his opening remarks. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm John Farley, uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Antimicrobial Products here at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, which is often called CEDAR, uh, here at the FDA. This is a very important meeting today, and we're very excited uh, to be here today to hear from patients about how they think about Chagas and what they look for in Chagas treatments. Looks like we have a full room today, and I understand we have representation from patients, caregivers, advocates in the office, and also joining remotely, uh, advocates in the audience, rather, and also joining remotely uh, our folks uh, from the web. Thank you for being here and uh, being a part of this meeting. I also know we have representation from industry, academia, and other governor, government partners in the room, and I'm glad to see a high level of interest from those of you who also play an important part in the drug development process. Keep in mind through the discussions today that while FDA plays a critical role in drug development, we are just one part of that process. We protect and promote public health by evaluating the safety and effectiveness of new drugs. While we often provide advice to those who are developing drugs, we at the FDA do not develop drugs ourselves or conduct clinical trials. Drug companies, sometimes working with researchers or patient communities, are the ones who conduct trials and submit applications for new drugs to the FDA. It is then our responsibility to review the new drug application and ensure that the benefit of the drug outweighs the risks. The benefit-risk decision-making is an integral part of our review process, and what we hear from patients today can also help us understand how patients view benefits and risks of Chagas treatment. This morning is about listening to patients. We want to hear directly from you about how a disease affects your life and what you value in a potential treatment. Having this kind of dialogue is extremely valuable for us because hearing about what patients care about can help us lead the way in figuring out how to best facilitate drug development for Chagas disease. We think very carefully about the kinds of things we should be measuring in clinical trials and looking at when evaluating a new drug. And hearing your perspective on this is very important to us. What we hear from you today can help us understand how to develop better endpoints to measure the aspects of this disease that are important to you. This afternoon, we're going to have an opportunity to discuss ideas for clinical trials for new drugs for Chagas. We're very grateful that many of the world's experts have agreed to join us today. This discussion of ideas will not result in formal recommendations or a decision on a particular matter by the FDA, and this is not an advisory committee. Voluntary disclosure by expert panel members are listed in the program materials. In addition, Dr. Ribeiro would like to disclose that she is affiliated with the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative which has a number of collaborations, including licensing agreements to develop new drugs, and has consultancy agreements with Bayer Healthcare and Laboratorio Alia. Scientific workshops like this are informal, and we encourage participation in the discussion by patients, advocates, and other audience members in addition to the panel. And those microphones uh, are available and will remain available through the day uh, in the front of the room. This afternoon's scientific workshop is also part of the agency's program to, to facilitate the development of surrogate endpoints,
clinical endpoints and other scientific methods for predicting clinical benefit. This is in accordance with Section 901 of the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, signed into law on July 9, 2012 by President Obama. That section is entitled Enhancement of Accelerated Patient Access to New Medical Treatments. This afternoon we will be discussing potential surrogate endpoints, possible clinical endpoints, and their ability to predict clinical benefit. We will have an FDA press officer in attendance at this meeting. Her name is Ms. Lindsay Meyer. Lindsay, are you here yet? Uh, so Lindsay, please leave, uh, raise your hand one more time and identify yourself. Most of the industry press folks know Lindsay already. We have Spanish translations available for the morning presentation and the morning discussion questions. Uh, should you be in need of a Spanish uh, presentation, uh, please uh, go out to the registration desk and we will make that available to you. Uh, Maria, do you want to translate what I just said? Go ahead. Oh, you need a microphone. Dr. Farley dice que habrá traducciones en español de la sección de la mañana, las preguntas y la presentación en español para todos los que la soliciten. Ok, gracias. Uh, so thank you again for your participation and for being here today. Uh, I'll now turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Teresa Mullen, who will provide background on the FDA's patient-focused drug development efforts. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, so uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. We have this initiative called uh, patient-focused drug development. We're having this meeting as one of, a, of, of several in, in different disease areas. And I'll just give you a little bit of background about that. So as Dr. Farley mentioned, um, FDA is responsible for conducting that benefit risk assessment of new drugs and actually uh, looking at drugs throughout their, their what we call life cycle. When they're on the market, we continue to evaluate whether the benefits still exceed the risks. And in looking at that evidence of benefit versus risk, it's really critical that we put that in context. What we hear from all of our scientific experts and clinicians is that they need to put that in the context of a disease, which is to say, what is the severity of this disease? And what are, is it, what's the degree of unmet medical need? And, uh, and so those are really what, uh, and, and, and we know that patient's perspective is quite critical to really understanding that. The patients are the ones who are living with the disease. They're the ones that are going to gain any benefit there is to gain from the therapies that we have available, and they will experience the harms. And so we realized in going into this, uh, actually, this program was reauthorized at the same time that the FDA Science and Innovation Act that Dr. Farley mentioned in 2012, that we didn't really have a good systematic way to reach out and hear from patients. We have some very valuable programs, the Patient Representative Program, which allows us to talk to individual patients and bring them into discussions typically concerning a particular drug and a particular issue. And because those issues are particular, we need to do a fair amount of screening of the, pa of the patient or the representative uh, to ensure there's no conflict of interest. And that sort of impedes our ability to get a larger um, sort of range of input from the patients who have the condition or the people who are working, living with them or taking care of them. And so this initiative is meant to just get a broader input from patients by disease, not in the context of a particular drug, but really in the context of the patient's experience with it. And so we know that this input is going to really be helpful to us in understanding uh, patient's perspective, and, and it will be uh, valuable to refer to subsequently when we have conversations with drug sponsors about development programs, when we look at what might be clinical outcome assessment endpoints, patient reported endpoints that would be helpful to consider, and so on. Uh, and so that's the, that's the rationale for this. And what we agreed to do in this um, reauthorized user fee program, which is a five-year program that will sunset in 2017 and will look to renew, is that we'll conduct at least 20 meetings, each in a different disease area, to try to do this kind of systematic collection of information. And the Chagas is one of the uh, diseases that we're looking at, one of the 20. And so we began this process in 2012, as I mentioned. And so far, we have 16 diseases. We actually uh, will soon publish the remaining, remaining diseases for 2016 and 17. Here are the diseases that you see teed up for the first three years of the program. Um, the ones we did in 2013, 2014. 
Uh, and here we are, Chagas disease for 2015, and we have a few more to go. Um, and so we're really looking forward to hearing um, what you have to tell us today. And each of these meetings is tailored a little bit. We ask consistently a set of questions about the impact of the disease on your daily life and on your life over time that you've had the disease and what you're doing to treat it currently and how well that's working for you, as Sojania outlined. And that's exactly the way our meeting flows. It goes through those questions in some depth. Um, we also may ask additional questions and we tailor each meeting. So for example, in this meeting, the afternoon is going to be sent, uh, spent on, on scientific uh, issues uh, to further advance um, development of products in this area. And uh, so uh, with that, um, we've uh, learned that the active engagement of patients and you're telling us uh, as much as you can about your experience, your perspective on this is really helpful when we take that back and think about and when we look at um, programs that might be coming through to treat the disease. We produce a report at the end of these uh, meetings. Uh, we have a docket that's open for a while in case people are unable to make it, but they're able to submit information to us into the electronic docket. We leave that open for at least uh, 30 or 60 days following the meeting uh, to gain any other uh, information we can. We add information from people who may be joining us on a webcast and produce this report that tries to very faithfully follow what we have heard in the meeting regarding uh, what it's like to live with disease and how well the treatments that people are using are working for them. And we think those reports are both useful in as a reference tool for patients, is what we've heard from patient groups who have been involved in some of these previous meetings. It's useful as a reference for our reviewers when they subsequently may get uh, applications or programs coming in for their review. And we think that it will really help us prompt the development of these other measurement endpoints to better capture patients' experience with living with the disease and then with therapy uh, going forward. And so those are the uh, aspirations we have for this program as well. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, our next speaker, Maria Allende, is going to talk about the disease. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for being here. My name is Maria Allende. I'm an infectious diseases physician and medical officer at the Division of Anti-Infected Products. And I will talk about an overview of Chagas disease and available treatment options. And this is my outline. I will talk about what is Chagas disease, why is it called Chagas disease, who can get it, what are the symptoms, how we make the diagnosis, and what are the treatments available. Uh, and, and, and I will also talk about the side effects of the medication. So what is Chagas disease? It's a disease spread by contact with feces of an infected insect called kissing bug, binchuca in Spanish or barbeiro in Portuguese. This is a blood-sucking insect that bites humans and animals, and after it bites, it defecates, and it carries the ag agent of the disease in its gut, which is um, a parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi. The disease can cause serious heart illness, and it also can affect swallowing and digestion. And on the bottom part, uh, you see the picture of what the parasite looks in the blood, because it eventually enters the blood. I will go into this a little later. And the two pictures below give you um, it's a close-up of the bug and that measures about one inch to one inch and a half. Uh, you can see it over a human hand. There are two phases of Chagas disease, the acute phase and the chronic phase. The acute phase lasts a few weeks or months, up to three months after infection, and the chronic phase can last years and even decades after the infection. Both phases are usually asymptomatic, have no symptoms, and that's the most common form or in some few cases can be life-threatening. Spontaneous cures are extremely rare, and once the person is infected, it's infected for life, usually, without treatment. Certain people are at higher risk for more serious disease, <clears throat> those with weakened immune systems, such as AIDS, or those receiving treatment after a kidney or organ transplant. So a bit of history here. Why is it called Chagas disease? It's 
um, it's called after, if you discover her, Dr. Char Carlos Chagas, a Brazilian physician who was studying another outbreak of another insect transmitted disease in Minas Gerais. And he discovered the first, first human case and described it. Uh, on the bottom, you can see a picture of him with Berenice, a two-year-old girl from Minas Gerais. And he made the connection with the presence of numerous insects in that area and decided to study them and found the parasite inside the gut of the insect and described all of these um, cycle of the parasite. He called the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi in honor of his mentor, Oswaldo Cruz. And that's why the disease is also called American trypanosomiasis. And uh, he took the blood from Berenice and injected it into laboratory animals, which died six days later with large amounts of trypanosoma in their blood, therefore confirming the cause of the disease. And on the right side of the picture, you can see the beautiful drawings of his first publication in 1909, um, which are um, described entirely the cycle of the parasite and the, and the human disease symptoms and characteristics. This was completely unprecedented for his time that one single investigator uh, described not only the agent, the, the cycle, the carrier vector, uh, the insect, and the disease in humans. The disease is also called Chagas Maza. It's well known in Argentina, by this way, in honor of the contributions of Dr. Salvador Maza, who documented widespread cases in northern Argentina starting in 1926 with the discovery of this infection in dogs from which the insect was taking the blood and completing the cycle in nature with humans. Dr. Maza died from a laboratory infection with Trypanosoma cruzi while working with patients' blood. So who can get Chagas disease? Most of what we know about Chagas disease is from the endemic areas uh, where transmission occurs. It's endemic to Latin America, South and Central America and especially in those who live in these rural areas, in these houses that you can see in the pictures made of mud and with a, a roof of straw. In the wall, there's a detail of the wall on the bottom. And the insect hides in these crevices on the mud wall during the day. And at night, it comes out to take the blood from the insects, from the humans and the animals. And you can see in this cartoon from a prevention poster from Brazil that usually the patient is asleep and the only exposed areas are the face and the arms. And the insect bites on that. It's called barbeiro because it bites usually in the face. And the bar barbeiro means barber, kissing bug also because of that. And the patient, um, the person scratches and helps the parasite gets into the blood. Also with the contaminated fingers, it can inoculate the parasite directly into the eyes, nose, and mouth. And therefore, it gains access to the blood and then to the organs. But also, the disease can be spread from mother to baby, congenital, and actually through more than one generation, mother, child, and grandchild. And organ transplants, blood transfusions too. These, these modes of transmission are very important in non-rural areas. Less common transmissions are laboratory accidents and contaminated food and drink that actually this has been described in tourists going to endemic areas and drinking juices contaminated with sugar that had um, elements of the feces of the insect. The disease is not spread though through casual person-to-person -person contact. And now uh, Chagas disease with migration in the last 20 years or so has spread around the world. In the darker color, you can see the endemic areas. It's endemic to 21 countries in Latin America. And in the softer color, you can see the, the infection follows the pattern of migration to North America and Europe, including Nordic Europe, Northern Europe, uh, Japan, and Australia. And in these cases, in these countries, the disease has mainly been described as congenital cases of people who were women who were infected and did not know about it and give birth to infected children. So what are the symptoms? Days after the contact in the acute phase, uh, some people, few people, can have body aches and fever, swelling of the eyelid at, or at the bite side, like we see in the picture. 
Uh, this is the, um, it's called Romania sign and it's produced by the, the site and it's not very common but when it is found it's very characteristic of the disease, um, particularly in endemic areas. It, the disease in the acute phase can also cause weak and inflammation of the heart, myocarditis, and inflammation of the brain in few patients. But as I said before, most people have no symptoms. It's a very silent disease. And years later, about a third of them, one in three approximately, may develop the chronic phase, which is characterized by heart failure, an enlarged heart, not pumping blood well, causing difficulty breathing and leg swelling irregular heartbeats that can cause sudden death and risk of stroke. And also, less commonly, problems with digestion and bowel movements. And in this picture, I illustrate how the disease, uh, how the agent, the parasitic agent, produces this disease. It invades the heart tissue with inflammation and infection, and it produces a weaken, weakening of the muscle and a dilation of the heart. In the large heart, which doesn't pump blood very well, and also that enlargement causes a disruption of the heartbeat conduction, which gives rise to severely irregular beats called arrhythmias. And on the bottom half of the slide is the gastrointestinal disease. It produces by the same mechanism, mechanism a dilation of the esophagus called achalasia, and a dilation of the intestine called megacolon with severe problems swallowing and um, constipation. So the diagnosis is made um, by testing the blood of the patient. There are several blood tests approved by the FDA in the recent past, and no single test produce, predicts who will or will not be sick, and usually more than one test is necessary to confirm the diagnosis. The tests are currently done at the CDC. The doctor sends the patient's blood sample to CDC through the local state health department. And uh, currently, the blood banks and or organ donor programs in the US screen for Chagas disease. And actually, some people find out that they have Chagas disease when they are trying to donate blood. So what is the treatment? There are two kinds of treatments, antiparasitic treatment to kill the parasite uh, with antiparasitic drugs. And this is the focus of today's meeting and also symptomatic treatment to manage the symptoms and signs of infection, usually cardiac drugs and pacemakers. There are no treatments currently approved by the FDA, but two drugs are available in oral tablets only, exclusively through the CDC at a doctor's request. And these drugs have been used in endemic countries since the 60s and 70s. They are called nifortimox and benznidazole. And the treatment consists of taking two or three daily doses uh, by mouth for 60 days. The CDC and the WHO recommend treatment in the acute phase, in, which is shortly after infection, and in the young with or without symptoms. And this includes babies infected from their mothers, children and adolescents, women who can get pregnant, patients with weakened immune systems, AIDS, treatments after um, kidney transplants, and patients less than 50 years of age without severe symptoms of heart disease. And these recommendations arise from the fact that the reported efficacy is higher, um, between 60 and 90 percent reported, when the treatment is given shortly after infection occurs, and especially if the patient is young and up to 18 years of age. This is where the treatment has been reported most successful. The treatment, however, is optional in cases where not, there's not much certainty of success, uh, such as patients older than 50 years of age without severe symptoms of heart disease. And it's not currently recommended in pregnant women and patients with severe kidney or liver disease because the drugs are contraindicated in these cases. And it's not uh, currently recommended for patients with severe heart disease, although a Clinical study is currently ongoing to determine the benefit of treatment in these cases. So in this slide, I have the commonly reported side effects of nifortimox and benznidazole. 
they have similar toxicities, um, most commonly in I-40 mugs with the loss of appetite and weight loss, uh, with nausea and vomiting that sometimes can interrupt or suspend treatment. And benzmidazole, the allergic skin rashes also are a frequent cause of suspension or interruption. Um, however, um, in, with either drug, the side effects improve after stopping treatment. And in general, the younger the patient is, the um, best, the, the better they tolerate the medication. The side effects are more common with, in older patients, the older they get. But babies and young children tolerate it very well. In this slide, I want to make a, a summary of all the things I, I have just talked about. Chagas is a disease that can be transmitted from mother to child congenitally, even through uh, more than one generation. It's also transmitted through blood transfusion and organ transplants. It has an acute and a chronic phase. And in both phases, most people do not have symptoms for many years, but they still can transmit the disease. Infections usually last for a lifetime without treatment. And about a third of all infected people get life-threatening cardiac disease many years after the infection. In a small number of people, the acute disease can also be life-threatening. There is no drug approved in the US, but treatment is available through STDC program. So here are my acknowledgments to the leadership and management of several offices in the FDA, my colleagues, and special thanks to all the panelists. And also, I want to express my gratitude to my first mentors of my hospital in Argentina, where I first trained and first met patients with Chagas disease, and to my patients from the past, present, and future, on whose behalf we hope to one day eradicate this disease. And this is the picture of my hospital in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where I first trained. And being from Argentina, I can also, I have to thank um, Lionel Messi for his uh, advocate, uh, being a, such a good champion for the fight against Chagas disease. Thank you all. So thank you to my FDA colleagues for your remarks. What I'd like to do now is to go over the discussion format. As I mentioned, we have two topics that we'll be reviewing today. Topic one is on the symptoms that matter most to you. So here what we're listening for is what worries you most about your disease? And what are the symptoms that you experience? And how does it impact your daily life? Are there activities or things that you like to do that you're not able to do as fully as you would like, or not able to do at all because of the symptoms that you experience? And also, tell us how your symptoms have evolved over time or how they've changed. So we recognize that this was a very difficult topic to write about, but we sincerely appreciate our panelists spending the time to really walk us through you know, how they felt and what they're feeling now. So we appreciate that very much. And then we'll move on to topic two, which is on the current treatment approaches to Chagas disease. So here what we're listening for is what are you currently doing to treat your Chagas disease? What is your current treatment regimen? And what are the biggest downsides that you're experiencing because of these treatments? And then we'll talk about what you look for in an ideal treatment. We also have some scenarios that we'll go over with you when we get to topic two to, to hear from you and learn from you on how you make decisions regarding these treatment approaches. So first, we're going to hear from a panel of patients and caregivers and patient representatives. And on that note, could I have my topic one and topic two panelists please come on up and have a seat at the panel table? So I've been working with our panelists over the last few months, actually. and. They have been so wonderful in really putting these thoughts down on, on paper and you know sharing these stories with us. So thank you for doing that. 
And the purpose of our panel discussion today is to really, you know, set a good foundation for understanding what our patients are thinking and what matters to them most. So they will set a really good foundation for our greater discussion. And they reflect a range of experiences with chagas, which we will learn in just a bit. And once they're done speaking, we're then going to broaden the dialogue and we will encourage other patients on the web or patient representatives on the web and in the audience here today to contribute to this discussion. Uh, and we want you to build on what you've heard from the panel. So for those caregivers and patient representatives and physicians and experts in the, in the audience, Please also share with us if you know what you're hearing from the panel is representative of the patient population that you see and that you work with. So periodically, we will ask some questions. Then I'll turn to my FDA panel also for some questions. And we invite you to, to you know participate in this dialogue. And we ask if you could just please raise your hand. And uh, we and actually you you have microphones at your table, but for Others that want to raise their hand, uh, we will bring a microphone over to you, or you could speak into the microphone at your table. And please state your name before answering, and that way we can make sure we have that in our transcript as well. So I understand we also have about 40 participants joining us on the web. So thank you very much to those of you on the webcast for joining us. We can't see you, but we are truly thankful that you're here and you're participating and you're a very important part of our meeting. So we will check in with the web periodically to see what comments are coming in. And we'll also be going to the phones occasionally to hear from, from those of you on the web. And in fact, we do have one panelist uh, that will be joining us on the web also. So we also have another way of continuing this discussion and continuing to hear from you, and that is through the public docket. So the public docket, you can find the website right here on, on the slide, and it's going to be open until June 29th, so two months from now. And the purpose of this public docket is to have you all continue to visit it, share your experiences, share your thoughts and perspectives, and all of these comments will be incorporated into our summary report that Teresa mentioned just a, just a few minutes ago. And anyone is welcome to comment here. So we really do encourage you to go there and visit the site often and continue to share your thoughts there. We also have a few other resources at FDA that we'd like to share with you. The first is the FDA Office of Health and Constituent Affairs, OCA. And the second is the Cedar Office of Center Director. We have the Professional Affairs and Stakeholder Engagement, PACE group. And both of these offices and groups are here for you uh, for additional uh, questions. And, and they're really patient representative programs. So we encourage you to reach out to them for additional information. Last but not least, we do have a few ground rules that we'd like to share with everyone. So this meeting is really about the patients that are here the healthcare providers, the caregivers, and the advocates to share your perspectives and your thoughts and experiences. So FDA is here to listen. We know that there's also other members of academia and industry and other government agencies here. And we know that this is we're, we know that this is going to be a very important meeting to all of you also. But we encourage you to stay in listening mode. The discussion is going to focus on symptoms and treatments. And we know that there are many, many aspects of Chagas disease that we will not be covering here today. Uh, but we really, really want to hear from you on, on the symptoms and the treatments and these topic questions, as they're really very beneficial for us to learn from. So anything, again, outside the scope of these symptoms and treatments that we'll be discussing, we encourage you to sign up for open public comment to share those thoughts. The views expressed here are today are personal opinions. And on that note, respect for one another is paramount. And last but not least, we will have evaluation forms for you closer to the end of the meeting. They're also available on the registration desk. It's really important for us that if you could fill these out and, and you know leave them on your desk uh, or put them out on the registration desk after the meeting is over, we really do learn quite a bit from those evaluation forms. And it helps us to know what worked for you today and what we can improve on. 
So on that note, what I'd like to do is turn it over to our panelists to share your thoughts with us. So we'll start with Candice. And if you could please introduce yourselves when it's your turn, you just have to press the red button. Go ahead, Candice. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Candice. I'm 51 years old. I'm from Texas. I found out about a year and a half ago that I do have Chagas. I've been tested three times, and the last time was by CDC themselves. Um, I have three children and four grandchildren. I do not live in a mud hut. Um, I live in a brick home, a nice neighborhood. And I work in the oil field industry, which is, of course, not the place to be right now. Um, on July 2nd of 2013, when I was 49, I took the opportunity to give blood, donate. And uh, on August 19th, I received that letter um, from Austin that said that I had Chagas. Two days later, I had my first doctor's visit with uh, Dr. Rodney. Um, he did not know how to treat it. Um, he went ahead and run all the tests. He did an echo and some blood work on me. Um, but then he ended up sending me to a Dr. Lemos. He's an infectious disease doctor uh, in College Station. Uh, but again, too, Dr. Lemos didn't know anything about Chagas either, not how to treat it. But he did go ahead and do the second blood test and came back confirmed yes. And he said, well, we're going to go ahead and get that medication. And as soon as he let CDC know that I had it, then they did their own blood work. Um, it took me 24 weeks from the time I had my first visit with the doctor until I started my medication. That's six months later. Um, I do know that the kissing bug exists in Texas because I personally have found one, not in my home, but it was already dead, and I sent it to uh, College Station, uh, to Texas A&M, and they confirmed that it was, it was positive with the antibodies. As a matter of fact, um, the Sarah uh, Hammer Lab, uh, Rachel Curtis, those are the two people that I've gotten most of my, my information from on Chagas, uh, and they work with animals. Not with humans, but yet I, that's where I went and I got my information from them. And I do thank them. And I still stay up with Rachel Curtis. Um, on my second visit to the physician that did treat me, I asked him if I should go ahead and tell my neighbors, let them know, look, this bug does exist. Of course, they, no one's ever heard of it. And he looked at me and asked me if I knew who Typhoid Mary was. I don't know if everybody knows who Typhoid Mary is. I kind of had the general, and I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. He said, well, if you want to be Typhoid Mary, then you go ahead and tell them. So I have kept quiet. Uh, to this day, I live in a small town, but to this day, only my closest friends and my family know that I have Chagas. Um, it, to me, he made me feel embarrassed and ashamed, like I had done something nasty and dirty to have gotten this. Um, I did end up taking the benzonazidol for 63 days, and I zoomed right through it. The hardest thing about taking that was I couldn't have drinks with my girlfriends in the evening. And I was drinking iced tea, and they were drinking Long Island iced teas. <laughs> um, as far as my symptoms go, I don't know if the symptoms that I have have anything to do with Chagas, because um, I have a lot of anxiety. Uh, so if my chest is hurting me, is it because I've got some little critter crawling around in me? I don't know. I think a lot of that is is uh, anxiety. I have, um, but I don't sleep well. I don't sleep well at all. I'm I'm tired. I do go to bed 
early before it's even night outside. Um, I go to bed before the party starts. And, um, but I wake up five and six times a night and then go right back to sleep. Um, I feel like, I believe that I got the Chagas through an open wound in my leg. Uh, it took months and months to heal. Um, that it happened in, a, in May and um, in July, it actually looked like a large ringworm around this area. And in August was when I found out I actually had Chagas, and I just immediately just knew that that's where it was, that, that I got it. I don't know. Um. I guess really that's about it for me. Thank you so much, Candace. Thank you. Myra? Good morning, everyone. My name's Myra Gutierrez, <clears throat> and I'm from El Salvador. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with Chagas in 1997 after donating uh, blood to the Red Cross. Uh, from the point that I donated blood, it took about a few weeks, I think, for me to get a letter from the Red Cross. In 1997, there wasn't a lot about Chagas, so I got a very vague letter stating that they couldn't use my blood, call 1-800 number, um, which kind of freaked me out. And so I did, and I got an answering machine, left a message, and then she called me back at work and then asked if I was by myself. And so, of course, at that time, I'm thinking I have AIDS and I'm only 19, 20, you know, not even married because... Why else would she be asking if I'm by myself? She said if I'm not by myself to go to a room where I was, so I proceeded to go to an office. And that's when she told me I had Chagas. And I have no idea what Chagas was. And she couldn't answer that question because she had no idea. So she said I was going to get a booklet in the mail and it was going to give me an idea, kind of an overview of what it was. And I received that booklet. And it was basically a one-page booklet of, you know, this is how you get it, this is what it is, this is what the homes look like. And when I saw the picture of the homes, I said, that's exactly where I lived when I was a child. I was born and raised in El Salvador, and I uh, migrated to the United States in uh, 1981. Uh, so I knew there and then that that's where I, I got it from. Do I remember getting bit? No. Do I, did I get any of the signs? Nope. Um, so from that point, I went ahead and did the obvious thing that, that everyone else would do. I went to, I made an appointment, went to my primary care physician. And uh, when I told her, her words to me were, the only time I've heard of that, that disease was during medical, medical school, medicine school. She didn't know what to do with me. She didn't know where to send me. Um, just didn't have a clue. So what she did was she sent me to a CDC specialist, uh, which I will travel back in two, um, and it took me about 30, 40 minutes. So I thought I was in good hands with the CDC specialist. Well, I wasn't. CDC specialist didn't know what to do with me in 1997. His first question was, well, can you swallow? I'm like, well, yeah, I can swallow. Well, then there's nothing wrong with you. I said, but I've heard that there's treatment. He said, no, I'm part of the this and that, of the CDC, if there was treatment, I wouldn't know about it. I will let you know. They proceeded to go through the same thing of retesting me, but she sent me back to my primary physician, and the lab didn't know what kind of testing to do. So I waited about an hour so they can figure out how they can test me for, uh, to get confirmed that I had Chagas again. And I went back to the CDC specialist once it was confirmed, and uh, he just basically went back to point one. Well, can you swallow? I'm like, I can swallow. But that was the point of, of, I think I did that for six months. And then I got tired. I was calling him every week and his nurse. And I just didn't want to deal with it anymore, so I stopped. So I went from 1997 to 2008, where my sister frantically called me one night and said, turn on the TV, turn on the TV turn on the news report on Channel 11, and this is back in California. I did. By then, the report had ended, but she 
was able to take the information for the Fillmore uh, Chagas Clinic with Dr. Maimandi. I called the next day, and within a week, I had met up with her. I had most of my questions answered. I was on my way to get my first treatment. Um, I was still confused. I, I didn't know how I got it, how, why, what's going to happen. Luckily, she talked to me, my husband, um, answered most of my questions. You know, I still have questions, but am I ever going to get an answer? I, I don't know because it, it feels like it's so new. No one knows a lot about it. But it took 11 years for me to find someone to treat, treat me. I took Nifartamox, and uh, I lost 25 pounds. But as a woman, well, a woman doesn't want to lose weight, so... I've been a mine. My mother-in-law wanted to take the treatment. She didn't even have children. <laughs> so they were like, well, can you just ask your doctor if you not can get them? Um, that's the only side effect. I started the treatment with other patients. Some of them, you know, had to be uh, taken away from the treatment. So I was very blessed. I've been very blessed to have my doctor because she's taken me through all the steps of, of everything. Without her, I don't know what I would be. Um, and since then, every year, I get monitor. And we have the only Chakas clinic in the United States, and I live 10, 15 minutes away from it, so how lucky am I? Um, so every year I get monitor, I get to, the echo, the CDC, uh, you know, we started with the heart MRIs. So I feel very blessed that I'm able to get to that. I'm like, you know, one thing that I learned from this conference is the first time that I get to meet other patients. I've always been the only one in all the conferences that I've attended. So I was, I was telling Candace, I was so excited, not that you have a disease, but just to meet someone else that, you know, has a disease that I can relate to. So to go back and forth of, you know, what to do, what, what questions, I, I, was, I was really happy this morning. And then I, you know, met another patient, too, that I was excited to meet. Um, so it, it's been a roller coaster of a ride. You have your emotions. You know, you don't know what to do, what to expect. A lot of it's unsetting. You don't know. You can go to your doctor. I just recently did, actually, and uh, for my physical, I was telling Candace. And I, um, I told the doctor, well, I have chakras. He said, it's 2015. And he said, chakras. And uh, he said, I never had a patient with chakras. Um, but he wrote it on my comments, on my... Um, because I, I guess I'm anemic. And he said, I think it's due to your chagas. So I'm like, okay. I don't think it's my chagas, but if that's what you're going to blame it on. Um, I was sent to, uh, to another specialist to get some other testing done. And uh, that's and I, last week, uh, that specialist said the same thing. Uh, but he was more intrigued and asked me all these questions, which I didn't mind. Uh, because same thing, he's never had a, uh, he was a gastroenterologist, like he's never had a chakras patient. So he was writing every single thing, question that he had, which I didn't mind. If, if I could be your guinea pig for you to learn, by all means, I don't mind at all. Go ahead, ask away. If it can help us get better treatment, bring out awareness, why not? Because it was frustrating for me 11 years. My daughter was born at seven months, four pounds. Was it related to chagas? I don't know. No one can answer the question. I was in the hospital for seven days after I delivered my son because I lost so much blood. My question is, is it chagas related? I don't know. No one knew. But little things like that makes you wonder, well, is it related to that? Is it related to this? It just, uh, it's just a not knowing. So I like to speak because I like to bring awareness. As patients, you know, my doctor can only do so much for me. But if I don't speak, no one's going to do much for, for ourselves. We, we have to bring it out. Thank, like thank you, Maya. And, and you bring up some really great points that we'll definitely be okay. discussing in topic two as well with, with your treatment regimen and, okay. and the side effects. But thank you very much, Maya. Rachel? Good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Marcus, um, and I'm here with two hats today. Uh, the first is that I'm a clinical cardiologist uh, practicing in Washington, D.C., uh, and through my work, I've had the opportunity to meet 
a few patients with advanced cardiac illness from Chagas disease, and I'm hoping to help facilitate their discussion with you today. Um, the other hat that I have is being the medical director of a nonprofit uh, in the Washington, D.C. area called La Socha, which is the Latin American Society for Chagas Disease. And uh, we are a patient advocacy organization, and I am the medical director of this program, and we're screening and treating Latin American immigrants in the D.C. area. Uh, and I see my president of the organization, Jenny Sanchez, who's in the back of the room. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing with La Socha and then turn back to the patient voices because they're so much more interesting than what I have to say. Um, but the start of our organization was when Jenny, who came from Bolivia to the United States many years ago, uh, went to the obstetrician when she was pregnant with her first child and asked for a Chagas test. And the obstetrician looked confused and said, I, I don't know what that is. So then Jenny went back for her second visit with the obstetrician and said, I, I really would like my Chagas test. And the obstetrician said, well, you know, I, I looked that up, but we don't have that here. That's only in, in South America, so you don't need it. And just exemplifies what uh, the two previous panelists have said, which is there's a huge lack of awareness about Chagas disease uh, in the United States. And for many people, the one and only time they'll hear about it in their medical training is in medical school, and then they promptly forget about it. Well, Jenny realized that there's a huge group of Latin American immigrants in the D.C. area, including somewhere between 70 and 200,000 uh, immigrants from uh, Bolivia, which is everyone here knows, a, a country that is extremely stricken by this illness. And so she had the idea to try and come up with a patient advocacy organization, and I was interested in doing clinical work with patients, and so we joined forces about two years ago. Um, I'm really honored to be included up here as a care provider, particularly when Sheba Maimondi is in the audience, who has far more clinical experience than I do, and I hope she'll have a chance to share her experiences um, with the clinical care as well. Um, but some of the frustrations that we've encountered and our patients have encountered are that generally they're poor, they're uninsured, they're Spanish speakers, and frequently they're undocumented. So their access to care to begin with is extremely fraught. Then they're faced with a medical community that really doesn't know very much about Chagas disease. And even if they're extremely well-intentioned and want to try to help, when they hear about the fact that the medications are not commercially available, that you have to actually go through the process of signing a consent form to be able to get the medicine, that the medication requires extremely careful follow-up, that there are certain costs, although the medication is free because it's administered through an IRB, that there are costs associated with the follow-up care, and unfortunately, a small but real risk of very serious side effects that even wonderful free clinics in the Northern Virginia area have chosen not to embark on screening and treatment programs because they feel that the issues are so cumbersome. And we see this as well. It's very difficult to take care of patients who have to travel two hours for their treatment and may or may not be able to have immediate access to follow up if they have a side effect, which as everyone knows is really very common with these medications. So we've been trying to do some screening and treatment, um, and it's been successful though thus far, although uh, as also everyone knows in the room, there are high risks of side effects, and about 85% you know, of people will be able to finish their therapy, but it's a little bit scary uh, to do that in this, with this particular community, knowing that there is a risk of causing them a life-threatening complication that they would be in no position to, to pay for the, the medical care that, that follows. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about our program. And then I'd like to uh, introduce um, Carlos Tobabesa um, and to ask him to share with his experiences. Um, he uh, currently has a left ventricular cyst device uh, to treat him for his class four congestive heart failure that's a result of Chagas disease. Thank you, Rachel. Carlos? My name is Carlos Tobaya Perveza, and I'm here because it's a privilege to be here to speak with all of you to talk about Chagas. I'm also from El Salvador. In my country, there's a lot of Chagas. And because during the night, when it gets dark, that insect comes and it bites. And so I've suffered from this for a long period of time, but I didn't know 
en mi país no no in my country, no, no detectaron que they don't tenía detect esa it. enfermedad. They didn't know that we had this este, uh, disease. Empecé a mareos y so todo. I began with Ajá, very symptoms being dizzy. No me daba hambre. Well, I didn't have an appetite. Ajá, entonces vine el 2011 a este país. So I came here in 2011 to this y country. And I had vomiting. Y mareos. And I was um, es, dizzy. Pero no iba a, al médico porque But I didn't go to the doctor no tenía seguro. I didn't have insurance. Entonces, so, este, su, regresé al Salvador, I al año back, de haber venido, regresé al Salvador. I went back to El Salvador in the year that I was supposed to go back and este, fui por un mes. I was there for a month. Allá me puse peor. And I got worse while I was there. El 2011, este, in 2011, en mayo, in May, fui al médico. I went to the doctor, no tenía seguro, even though I didn't have insurance. Fui al médico. So I went to the doctor. Fui a Boston. Mm, to Boston. Y allí detectaron que and, tenía la enfermedad de Chagas. And it was there that they uh, detected and diagnosed that I had the Chagas disease. Yo no sabía nada I este, didn't know anything about this. De cerca de la enfermedad I didn't know anything about this disease. Pues yo este, en mi país este, trabajé en la unidad de salud. Mm -hmm, but I worked in a health unit in my country. Por seis, pues, por seis años. For six years. Y Hablábamos acerca del zancudo, del dengue. And they talked about Ajá, some of the y, insects that were there. Pero de chagas, este, but, no, no sabía yo but they didn't talk about cómo era, era esa enfermedad. And we didn't know how anything about this disease. Y yo no sabía que yo la tenía. And I didn't know I had it. Yo este, trabajaba para que otras personas And so I este, worked there, no I, tuviesen esas enfermedades. So that yo, other people wouldn't have the same Pero yo no sabía que yo la tenía. But I didn't know that I had it at the same time that I was working. Mm -hmm. Pero para mí es un gran privilegio but poder ayudar a otros. But it's a great to be able to help other people. Ayudar a otros. Entonces, este... Bueno, me dice el doctor, este, so, tienes la enfermedad de Chagas. The ya doctor said... In, do in Boston that I had the Chagas disease. Y para mí fue una sospecha, o sea que una, no hay ni que, ¿cómo explicarles? I don't know exactly Porque how to explain it. Dijo, I just ¿cómo felt, es que yo hablaba acerca de esta how, enfermedad how y yo la tenía? How was it that I was talking about it, bringing awareness to it, and I had it without knowing about it? Así que, es, so, es bien, este, difícil it's tener esta difficult. enfermedad. When you have this disease, es bien difícil porque it's difficult because empieza con vómito y muchos síntomas. And you have a lot of different queda. symptoms that y remain. Este, ahora me ha tocado que estar en, estoy en, en la lista de espera. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on a waiting list. Fui este, de Boston. From Boston, este, I went to me trasladé para acá, para they Maryland. They sent me here to Maryland. Mm -hmm. y, a, y ahora estoy en, en lista de espera aquí. And so I'm on a waiting list here. Washington. Washington. Así que, si a otros, so if we can help others, es, eh, es bueno a los demás. Uh, it's good to help the others. Uh, y si podemos, este, And if we can a, explain si de ustedes, uh, to some of you, este, preguntar algo mm -hmm. I would want to ask you de, de about the symptoms. If you pues want to ask about the symptoms, we're here. And we're Ayudarles prepared to help you in, in, in whatever we can do to help. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you. OK, and do we have Maria joining us on the phone? She, hasn't, she hasn't called in yet. Sure. So, and, and, and Rachel, if you don't mind, could you repeat the question just so everybody on the web heard it and maybe those sitting in the back of the room? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sheba, for asking that question. And, and maybe Mr. Betha can also share with us the symptoms that he was having at the time that he had to have this placed. Um, uh, Mr. Betha had very, very severe congestive heart failure um, and was in the hospital for five months. Um, and his, the symptoms were refractory to the typical uh, medications that are administered for heart failure therapy. So he had a pump placed into his left ventricle, uh, which basically does the work of the left ventricle for him. Uh, and he wears it on a bag on his chest. Um, he has to change the batteries every two and a half hours. Uh, the machine will beep, but he tries to do it before then. Um, and then he plugs the machine in at night and sleeps attached to the machine. 
uh, and this is a temporizing measure uh, while he's on the heart transplant list. Um, there are certain medications that you need to take when you're on this machine. You have to take a blood thinner. He also takes the other medications for heart failure, um, but there is a risk of clot, blood clotting and infection and uh, device failure. Uh, he's done extremely well with this thus far, though I can tell you that he and I walked here a long walk from the parking lot and he was uh, making me walk faster than I usually do. So it's been a wonderful change for him. Uh, but Mr. Basak, uh, can you tell us uh, what your symptoms were like when you were in the hospital, how poorly you felt? Si los si los sim es, the symptoms were, este, me dolor de cabeza, I had a headache, vomito, como I was ya vomiting, dije anterior, like vomito I had been doing before, es una depresión, and a depression, que usted no quiere hablar con that nadie, you don't want to talk to anybody, es una tristeza que usted and you're just so sad, Mientras me, estuve cinco meses and en I was hospital, five months in the hospital, me and they were always observing me, Luego me pusieron and after that they gave me this apparatus. Un aparato, este aparato, este, cuando me lo pusieron, and when they gave it to me, este, ya, ya cambió la situación. my situation changed. Fue para bien. And I, it got better. Más antes yo no Before podía that, ni comer. I, I couldn't eat. Porque todo lo que comía lo, lo vomitaba. En because el everything that palabra, I, everything that I was eating, uh, I was vomiting. Uh, pero no detiene nada. Uh -huh. And I wasn't able to maintain anything, peso, keep anything in my weight. Merma. It was just up y, and down. Pero ya con este aparato, but with this apparatus, ya me, se siente mejor I, I feel so much better. Se siente mejor porque, I feel better because aunque la, por la, tiene que even though I have to be permanently connected batería, to this, to this um, battery, este, tiene que estar pendiente Uh -huh. de, I always de have to, be, I always have to have in mind when is, the, when is the battery going to run out so that I can make sure that I change it on cambio, time. Pues, nada más tres horas, mm -hmm. And it only lasts three hours. Y tiene que hacer el and then you have to change it. Este, luego, este, la, por las noches, and during the night. Hay una, una conexión, there's a connection. Una, este, una para There's an extension so that I can be connected to it at night. Tiene que dormir uno conectado a la electricidad. Oh, so you have to sleep connected para to no the electricity tener, so that este, if you don't do that, cada uh -huh. tres horas. Uh -huh. and you still have to change it every three hours Pero, if, if you weren't connected. Quiero decir que así, así en, o sea, que me siento mejor. But I still feel so much mejor. better. Much better. Porque a como estaba antes. Better than I was before. Ah, es mejor. It's so much better. Cambia la situación. So my situation has changed. It Aunque changed. Usted tiene que estar pendiente Even though you have to keep in mind what time it is, and you can't let the battery run out. Porque si, si la batería este llega, se termina, Because empieza a hacer una out, gran alarma. There's an alarm that will go off. La alarma, entonces tiene It's que hacer el cambio alarm. antes. So you have to change it before the alarm goes off. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. This one? Okay. So once again, as I mentioned before, we will definitely be spending quite some time on on the treatments that you're taking uh, and certainly the downsides that you experience with those treatments. But first, could we please give our panelists a round of applause for coming here? And so thank you all for being here and for sharing these stories with us, especially after telling us that it's been hard to talk about this, you know, and and uh, find others to relate to. So I'm, I'm really glad and we're all very thankful that you're here to, to share these stories. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to just make a call out to my FDA colleagues there that when we do have our uh, final panelists join us, please just let me know and, and we'll definitely go to her. Okay, so I know we have, um, with the physicians and the scientific experts and, and those of you joining us, could I just see, uh, maybe by a show of hands, how many of you feel that what our patients described here, does, is that representative of what you also hear in your, in your patient population? And could you raise your hand if that sounds? Okay, great. Okay, and uh, what I'd like to do is now just spend a little bit more time learning about the symptoms that you've all mentioned. We heard dizziness, vomiting, anxiety, and Talk about what, what worries you most about your condition and how have these symptoms changed. So would one of you like to start us off by 
walking us through, have your symptoms changed at all? Are there such things, you know, do you have a good day versus a bad day? Does your symptom ever change based on the day? Carlos, Myra, Candice, would you like to? Candice, would you like to start us off? Well, uh, what worries me the most about my condition is not knowing. I don't know what to expect. And if I do have some type of a symptom, are the doctors just going to say, well, that's what it's, you know, that's anxiety, it's not your heart, it's heartburn, because um, not enough, well, nobody that I know in Texas knows anything about Chagas, none of the doctors. Um, symptoms, when I've read about Chagas and talking about symptoms, um, I've read many times about uh, sleeplessness, and I do have that. I am tired. I do go to sleep very easily. I fell asleep a couple of weeks ago in my office with my manager sitting right there. Uh, thank goodness she was in a good mood. But um, so I would say insomnia. I really don't have any of the symptoms that I think that you guys would be looking for at this time. Um, activities, though, uh, I do I do not uh, do a lot of activities. I don't go out and swing a baseball bat or anything like that because I know I don't have the energy. Um, I don't go on like trips down the park with the grandkids because I'm scared I'm going to get halfway there and have to turn around and come back. Um, my symptoms coming and going, I would say, no, they don't just come and go. I, I think they're there. They're there. I have anxiety from this, um, and I have sleeplessness that I think is caused from it also. Thank you, Candice. And just a quick follow-up with the insomnia that you talked about. Is it something where you feel as though you have to nap on a daily basis? or how Did do you, I need a nap? Um, I wake up in the mornings. I'm a morning person. I'm the one that's going to get up and clean the house in the mornings on the weekends. But by 11 o'clock, if the house is not clean, it's not going to get clean the rest of the day. Because at that time is when I'm getting tired. Um, and I can lay down and go to sleep. By the time I come home from work, I do sit most of the time at work. Um, but by the time I make it home, and it's 4.35 o'clock, I could just go, just doze right off in the chair. And I generally, I am in my bed, no kidding, by 6.30 at night. And I'll lay there and watch TV for about an hour or so, and I doze off. And I may wake up an hour later, but I can't keep my eyes open. Thank you, Candace. Myra, Carlos, Rachel, would any of you like to share? Do you have insomnia, and how do you how does that impact your life? Is it all right if I add something? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think that we, um, as providers, see uh, some distinct groups of patients with Chagas disease. There's a group of people in the indeterminate phase or the early chronic phase where they don't have any signs of cardiac damage yet, but know that they have the parasite, and in the patient population that Jenny and I are working with, many of these people are from Bolivia where what their worst symptom is is profound fear because almost all of the people that we identify as having Chagas have loved ones who've died from it. And they're faced with this new diagnosis. It's quite overwhelming. And then they have to try to navigate a system that's very, it's not very hospitable to them in order to try to get the care that they need. Then there's a separate group of people who started to have the heart uh, issues uh, that are come along with Chagas, including the kinds of symptoms that Mr. Beza was describing, passing out from slow heart rhythms, passing out from fast heart rhythms, needing to get defibrillators uh, that will give them shocks, which are extremely painful, congestive heart failure with swelling of the legs and shortness of breath uh, that can require hospitalization and ultimately the need for advanced therapies like he has or for heart failure. So those are the sort of things that, that we see, but 
as Dr. Allende mentioned, a lot of patients with Chagas disease are going to be in the indeterminate phase where they don't really have symptoms from the illness itself except for a profound worry about what's going to happen to them because as of right now, we don't know who's going to go on to develop the more worrisome and severe symptoms of, of uh, heart disease. Sure. Thank you, Rachel. FDA panel, did you have any questions? Yes, Dr. Fox. Yeah, hi, Dr. Marcus. You mentioned your patient, uh, your some work with a patient advocacy group. I was wondering if you could mention that. It sounds like you know, because I'm hearing a lot about the difficulty obtaining you know, health information and connecting. And if you could tell us the name of the patient advocacy group or resources, that might be helpful. I'd love to. Um, it's called La Socha, L-A-S-O-C-H-A, -A, and we have a website that is uh, under construction, but um, it's lasocha.org and a Facebook site, and we welcome any requests for information and are trying to help get people connected with the medical care that they need. So it's L-A-S-O-C-H-A dot org. And I'm curious, you know, for patients that do come to you, obviously, I mean, you've got a lot of experience, a lot of information you can share with folks. Are there other health resources that you think of or that you recommend to folks uh, where they may be able to get information about Chagas disease? Well, I think the CDC has a very comprehensive website. Um, I think that can be very helpful. Uh, PAHO, also particularly because it's in Spanish, uh, the Pan American Health Organization, the World Health Organization. Um, not everybody that I work with has access to the internet, though, so it can be more problematic. We're developing printed material. Our, our nonprofit just received final IRS approval to start receiving donations, so we're now in a position to come up with more printed material. But Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Yes, Teresa? So and this is a, a not a, it's partly listening to the, pa I mean, patients, what they're saying, like Candace and Mayor, it both sound like you learned about it through a uh, blood test for associated with trying to donate blood. And so it might have been the Red Cross or some other um, blood bank, you know. Uh, and I wonder, with my, for my CDC colleague, I guess, or maybe uh, Rachel would know, um, is it now uh, required that um, a, a blood don donation center that does that test report it? Are we able to collect information about the incidents? So for example, um, Candace was saying she doesn't know who else. I mean, you're probably not the only one in Texas, um, but are, 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 those infer are those data being collected now to know better how m many cases maybe are at least being picked up that way, even though that's just not going to be everybody? Yeah, that, that, I think that's a great question. Um, the American Association for Blood Banks, which I believe oversees around 70% of the blood banks in the United States, has recently published some of their data from their screening. And as of right now, their blood banks, I believe, screen any first-time blood donor, regardless of country of origin, uh, which is why you were picked up. I mean, there had previously been attempts to look to see whether or not someone came from an endemic region. Um, but it's not ubiquitous, like in many countries in, in Central and South America, where all blood donors are, are screened for the illness. And it's not a reportable condition. So if someone is diagnosed as having Chagas, it's not reported to the state, for example. I'm, I'm Dr. Um, you can't hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. And if you could just Yeah, it's on. Can you hear me? OK. I'm Sheba Maimandi. I'm a cardiologist. And I work in Los Angeles. And I have the Center of Excellence in Los Angeles, and we've been going now for eight years, and that's, um, Myra is mine. Um, the <clears throat> Chagas disease is not a reportable condition in the US. So as such, people are diagnosed, they're notified, and that's that's the end of it. So in Los Angeles, when they get diagnosed, currently they'll get our center's address and phone number to make contact. They can choose to do so, or they ch can choose not to do so. Um, oftentimes, if people have insurance, they go to their primary care provider, and they start that whole 
you know, going from primary care to infectious disease specialist and, you know, back and forth. Um, and I get a lot of calls and predominantly it's from patients themselves who have internet access or savvy enough to go online <clears throat> and to do a search. So I, I just have one comment that I really think is important. This is fabulous that we're doing this. It's fabulous that we're getting patients to speak and tell us of, our, of their experience. We do not want to wait for symptoms. This past month alone, I have three patients who, like Mr. Beza, <clears throat> got transferred to the cardiac care unit at UCLA. Um, and they're all on, two are on LVADs, not well enough to leave the hospital because they need suppressor support, additional medications. And I have another patient who's had so many ablations, they go into these terrible, terrible arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, where we have to go into the heart. And there's only a handful of, of centers in the U.S. that, that does this. Um, they essentially go in and make cuts to try to burn and cut pathways to stop the arrhythmias. To have a global impact on Chagas disease, we need to focus on diagnosing appropriate screening and treatment with the current meds we have available. We cannot wait for the Mr. Mr. Bezos of the world. We shouldn't. It's outrageous. You have a cardiologist who's out there doing screening because I don't want to see the Mr. Bezos in the world when we can prevent it. And I just need everyone to hear that. Again, even looking at Mr. Bezos, he looks rather well. And you don't really see and feel the impact of the disease. So I'm sure that uh, Dr. Marcus would concur. It's pretty horrific. And if you can treat, and cure, or at least prevent the progression of the disease or slow the progression of the disease, this is what we need to be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maimondi. Yes, Janka. Um, just wondering from the patient's perspective how um, the ease with which you can access the medicines from CDC, is that a fairly accessible process or is that a pretty high hurdle? Well, as I had said, um, what I understand, I, like I, I understood what she was just saying, but she's talking about what the medicines we have. The fact is, the medicines, the medicine that we have, two different kinds. You don't just walk into the, you know, yeah, the CVS and get it. Um, we need to make it to where you can get that medication now. As a matter of fact, I mean, m just because no one knows anything about Chagas, so I'm the internet girl here, uh, and I don't believe everything that the internet says. But I do believe um, that it says that the medication that I took should be taken within the first couple of months, first eight weeks or so. I got it 24 weeks later. So if had I just gotten it, I don't know that it is going to make me live any longer if I happen to be that 30 or 40 percent that it actually does attack. Um, we need to make sure that we get the medication here. We don't have to go to Argentina or, I don't know, wherever it is on the other side of the country there. Um, so that's why I'm here. I, just let's get the medicine here. If, if I could answer that as well. Um, I've had an extremely easy time getting the medicine from the CDC, been a very prompt. Um, the problem in my practice is then going through the consent form um, and in the, the way that I work with the patients, I make sure that I have plenty of time to read the entire consent form to them in Spanish, make sure that they have time to ask their questions. 
that's an exceedingly difficult proposition for anyone in a typical medical practice for whom the 20 minutes of going through that form is quite onerous. Um, the other thing is that for me it was very easy to sign on to the CDC IRB, but if you're associated with an academic institution, it can often be quite difficult because the institution may want you to have a separate IRB. Um, and I think it would be phenomenally easier to deal with this if it was something that we could just write a prescription for. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Janka, for your question. Do we have any comments coming in on the web? Um, just one comment on the web um, from Cecilia from Argentina who said that her father was treated for Chagas between the age of 18 and 78, but um, for a large part of that it was misdiagnosed as congenital cardiopathy. Um, he, she said that he suffered a stroke, microcardial infarctions, and dysrhythmia until he was prescribed with a pacemaker later on. Thank you, Graham. And that brings up a good point. So we've heard the difficulty in, in finding a physician that was able to treat you and diagnose you correctly. And this question goes out to you and to um, providers, healthcare providers in the audience. What a, do you find that misdiagnosis is a common theme initially, uh, or, or is it that you're not able to find somebody that can diagnose you with Chagas? Is misdiagnosis common? My, um, my experience has been that it's not a misdiagnosis, because no one even thinks of it, really, for it to be a diagnosis. So oftentimes, um, you know, for the majority, a lot of the, the, the blood donors who find out that they, they've got it, and then where do they go to get help? So most often it's the patients going in with, oh, I have Chagas, look, I have the letter from the Red Cross, what do I do? And then there's a lack of provider awareness in terms of what has to be done. And the majority actually are told, oh, don't worry about that, you don't need treatment. Um, we've, we've rolled out our screening um, into the primary care setting where I really strongly feel this needs to be. Um, if you're a Latin American immigrant, just once you get tested. Um, and I, with my own providers, am having challenges because they're telling me, well, you don't need to treat. So now I'm doing this whole education going to the different clinics and discussing it. So in terms of misdiagnosis, um, I don't think the diagnosis is made. It's not like it's misdiagnosed and they, they're calling it something else. Thank you, Dr. Mimondi. Any follow-up questions to this topic? Yes. Mati? A uh, couple of questions for you, Dr. Marcus. Um, so um, there are a few of your patients who really are not willing to sign on to the informed consent process and get on any of these medications. So what kind of follow-up do you have for them? Is it primarily monitoring them clinically, or, or do you also do um, uh, any kind of testing? Well, I might have misspoken. Um, the patients that I see are generally extremely incented to get therapy. Uh, most of them are Bolivian, and since they've seen their loved ones die from this illness, it's Chagas is a very, very serious medical problem in Bolivia. Um, they all want the therapy. Um, once they receive the therapy, then there is the ongoing need for follow-up to make sure that they aren't developing cardiac illness. But most of the patients that I've treated through the nonprofit are people with indeterminate phase illness who don't, at present, have significant cardiac damage. Just one other point. So in women of ch childbearing age, is it routine to screen them for Chagas if they come from endemic areas or have these high risk factors? Well, like Dr. Maimani was saying, nobody thinks of it. There's actually data, um, I think, that the American College of Gynecology put out about th that specifically documented how little knowledge there is about both Chagas disease in the obstetric community and the fact that Chagas disease can be tra transmitted congenitally in the, and I don't remember the precise numbers, but it's shockingly high numbers of people who are unaware of it. So there are people like Jenny who came and, and asked for the test. But by and large, uh, the practitioners in the United States are not going to think of this illness and look for it. If I could just yes. add to what Rachel was saying, in other countries, the one screening that is done, 
It's not done in the primary care settings, but the, the people that they do screen are the, the pregnant women. So places that have, like Spain, um, I think Argentina, Dr. Right? So, so, so um, they, they screen pregnant women. So that is something that, it, that we should be doing here also. Thank you, Dr. Mimandi. Yes, and we'll take one more comment here. Dr. Mimandi, if you don't mind passing the microphone. Hello. Can you yeah. hear me? Okay. Thank you. I'm Sergio Sosestani from Argentina. I would like to add uh, another concept, very important concept for me that I think that uh, pass very quickly in, in this discussion is about the, the psychologist's impact in the patient and also for the relative and friends of the patient. So I think that um, at this moment the opportunity to, to offer treatment changed the historical situation regarding care of patients. In our countries we are feeling at this moment as doctors that we have the opportunity to offer. Of course, we will discuss uh, this afternoon uh, the, the benefits and how we can demonstrate that benefit. But I would like to add this specific benefit, the psychologist benefit of the patient and, and, and relative. If you, are, if, you are, if you can offer treatment because doctors currently are feeling that uh, we are acting to change the, the history, the, the natural history of Chagas disease. And this is very important regarding the, uh, the, the near past. Ten years ago, the, the, the providers are just uh, an inspector of the natural history. At this moment, we can change this history. Thank you very much. So the psychological impacts. And we also heard social impacts, Candace, you talked about the emotional impact. So thank you for bringing that up. OK, uh, what we'll do is, at this point, let's take a short break. And we'll come back. And we'll talk, we'll dive much deeper into the treatments and what, how you're experiencing them, and hear more from the healthcare providers also. So thank you very much. And we'll take a 10-minute uh, we'll break. Thank you.